Shalom. Welcome to Light of the Nations. You know, we have finished our study on the Rambam, Maimonides' awesome Hilchot Beit HaBechira, all eight chapters, and this was really quite an accomplishment. We began and we finished, and not that uh, we've learned everything there is to learn about the Temple, not at all. But I think that the best summary we could give is that in these pages, in these chapters, Maimonides has laid out both the blueprint for the building of the temple and also the structure of the, com <coughs> the, of the commandments of the rebuilding of the temple and has really laid out an operational program of the divine service in every way. There are many more texts and there are an infinite number of details regarding the service in the temple that we still need to learn. I think we have something of a bird's eye view now in our appreciation of the uh, timeliness and the actuality and the, and the reality of the commandment. The commandment to build the temple is alive and well. That's one thing that we really walk away from the Rambam with is this feeling that we were not studying ancient history. Of course, that's a point that I try to stress and emphasize. We're not studying just a course of study, a discipline. Once upon a time, there was this magnificent structure. It represents this and that, and the Jewish people take it very seriously. That's not it here at all. I think one of the things that we really saw in the words of the great Maimonides is that it is a duty, which is really um, beckoning to the Jewish people in every generation to build the temple. And he takes the concept of the temple very, very seriously. That's one thing that we really saw. So here we are now at a crossroads. Um, we are going to be continuing our temple studies. And we have some new programs envisioned. We're going to be approaching some specific topics of the temple service. And we're going to be presenting as much information uh, and insight as we can in different levels of insights into some of the more important aspects of the temple service. And in the meantime, you know, um, this week we begin the month of Mar Cheshvan. And Mar Cheshvan is a, is a very strange month because it is coming on the tail of Tishrei. It is coming immediately after the month of Tishrei. The month of Tishrei, very regal, very action-oriented month, full of very direct um, application of all sorts of Torah principles full of mitzvot, the performance of various commandments with a lot of meaning and a lot of um, significance. We, we had the High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah, the days of Teshuva, Yom Kippur, and then almost immediately afterwards we had Sukkot. So we were dealing with shofar, we were dealing with teshuva, repentance, we were dealing with the four species and the sukkah. A tremendous amount of, of, um, of color and enthusiasm and activity. And now suddenly we come to the month of Cheshvan, and it's a month that doesn't have any major observances at all, not even a fast day. And indeed it's referred to as Mar Cheshvan, which means actually it's like a prefix of formality, same word in modern Hebrew meaning Mr. Like Mr. Cheshvan, we're not so friendly with him. We felt very friendly, very much on, on um, intimate terms with Tishrei, but Cheshvan keeps its distance a little bit. It's kind of foreboding, kind of formal. So there is so much to say about the month of Cheshvan, but I'll just remind us of one point of a midrash that we did learn regarding this month, which is very beautiful thought about the month of Cheshvan. And the midrash tells us, based on verses in the Torah, that the tabernacle which Moshe completed in the desert was actually completed in the month of Kislev. However, Hashem commanded Moshe to hold off on the dedication of the tabernacle and not to do it until the following Nisan, for various reasons. So, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, erected by Moshe, completed in Kislev, Hashem instructing him, no, don't do the dedication ceremony yet, wait until 
Nisan. And the Midrash tells us that the month of Kislev was embarrassed. Now, what does that mean exactly? A month is not a person. You can interpret it on a symbolical level, if you like, allegorical. Maybe it teaches us if we are going to be sensitive to a month, we should certainly be sensitive to other people. In any event, this is the expression of the Midrash. The month of Kislev was embarrassed and felt bad that Hashem was skipping over it. And so Hashem paid back the month of Kislev with the dedication of the second temple in the days of the Hashmonayim, that is to say the Hanukkah story, because even though the Hanukkah story is in the middle, towards the end of the Second Temple period. Our sages tell us that the dedication of the, of the Hanukkah end of the, of the Second Temple era was the real dedication, and the one that counts. And that's because, you know, all throughout the era of the Second Temple, there was a lot of intrigue. The people of Israel were under the thumb of foreign rulers, the kings of, of, of Media and, and, um, and Persia, and they were paying taxes, and they were and they were, there was a lot of infighting. It were difficult days. There wasn't any real taste of freedom and, and Jewish sovereignty until the era of Hanukkah, which after that the Second Temple only lasted 100 years or so. But the point is, it was a second dedication that really counted. And so Hashem paid back the indignation, the embarrassment of Kislev, of not having the tabernacle dedicated then, the payback being later in the time of the Hashmonaim, the dedication in the time of the Second Temple. And then the Midrash continues and tells us, so too, the First Temple was completed by King Solomon in this month, the month of Mar Cheshvan, which is called in the Torah, as we see in the book of Kings, Kings 1, chapter 6, verse 38, we see that the month of Mar Cheshvan is called Bul, Bet Vav Lamed, the month of Bul. And even so, even though the first temple was actually completed in the month of Mar Cheshvan, Solomon, through divine inspiration, knew that he was not to dedicate it during this month, but rather he was to wait until the following Tishrei. And again, the Midrash tells us the month of Mar Cheshvan was embarrassed. And Hashem pays back the month of Mar Cheshvan. He promises that the dedication ceremony for the third temple is going to be, in the future, in the month of Mar Cheshvan. So here we take this month, which is drab by all standards, especially comparing it to the predecessor, Tishrei, which was so full of, of um, activity. We say even this month, which is the only month on the entire calendar that is not marked by some observance or fast day or something, this month is on hold for the most beautiful holiday of all. This month is just waiting and it is, it is full in potential for such a great and joyous occasion, and that is the time of the dedication of the Third Temple. So how are we to understand this? First of all, I guarantee you, any time that we meet and that you catch me and we talk, I will prove to you that the day that we're sitting in and the, that particular month is the time for the building of the Temple. I'm an expert. I promise you, come to me any month of the year, and I will prove to you that it's written someplace that that's the month of the temple. And that's because, you know, I don't want you to be excited during the month of Mar Cheshvan and then be disappointed afterwards if we haven't built it yet. What about next month? Did we lose our chance? No, it's always time. But there's a beautiful teaching here. And yes, first of all, there is a tradition that this month is potentially connected, associated with full with the possibility from the very beginning of time with the third temple. But what, is, what does this really mean that the, the month was embarrassed and Hashem made a promise? I think that we are the ones in our generation that can fix this. And yes, there is an aspect of time almost being disappointed and, and coming to witness against us. How did we spend our time? We have this expression, spending time. The more that you think about it, the more you realize it's an uncomfortable expression. It's like a currency, and it slips through our fingers. We lose time. It's another expression. And so we can fix this historical, you know, um, incident. We can kind of do a rectification of the embarrassment of Kislev by being the people that we should be and by 
rising to the challenge of kiss of eslicha. We can fix. I meant we can fix the the um, embarrassment of Mar Cheshvan by rising to the challenge. And how will God keep this promise? How will He see to it that He pays back, as it were, the month of Mar Cheshvan? And what do you think is more important, paying back a month or paying back the people themselves? We can be the ones, the instruments, to see to it that this happens, but it's not going to happen automatically. It's only going to happen if we will it to be, then we will see the tikkun of this month, the Mar Cheshvan, and every day. And that is one thing that certainly should strike us after having finished the entire sefer, the entire work of Beit HaBechira, the laws of the Holy Temple, the laws of the Chosen House, because Maimonides takes this mitzvah extremely seriously. And we began in chapter 1 of Hilchot Beit HaBechira with a analysis of the mitzvah itself. And essentially, we talked about its um, definition. And uh, we had a, a pretty fundamental and basic analysis of the process of the building of the temple from the very beginning of time, how it was manifest in the time of the tabernacle, and how the temple was built from the era of the tabernacle in the desert until the second temple days. So if this is Mar Cheshvan, and there is a potential in the very air for fixing the previous embarrassment of the month, and seeing to it that this becomes the time of the building of the third temple, how is that going to happen? This is a major question, believe it or not, for many people. Even though we have now become somewhat more familiar with all of the different um, aspects of how these commandments are to be fulfilled through the tremendous and orderly um, structure of the great Ram the Rambam's writing, still, you know, there are so many people that are not clear about this. I think the Rambam made it very clear by beginning Hilchot Beit HaBechira and telling us in the following words in the very first halacha of the first chapter, and this is what we learned so long ago, the first halacha, mitzvah taseh la sot bayat lashem. It is a positive commandment to, to make a house for God. Muchan lehiyot bo makrivim bo hakorbanot. Ready to bring there to the offerings, ready to offer the various korbanot there. V'chogigin elav shalosh pa'amim b'shana. And we celebrate there three times a year Shanamar, as it states in the famous verse in Exodus 25:8, Vasuli Migdash, you shall make for me a sanctuary. And that's how the Rambam begins his tremendous work, Hilchot Beit Abachira. So it seems that he takes the concept of building the temple as a serious commandment, like all the other commandments. And indeed, that's what the rest of the work that we studied is all about, how to fulfill that commandment. But yet, there are in the world so many different opinions that we hear all the time. And how many times does this happen? Very often that someone will say, well, I thought that the temple is only something that can be built by the Messiah. And they'll say, isn't it true that Mashiach is supposed to come and rebuild the temple and you can't do it without him and you don't have permission to do it without him? And then, of course, there are people that say that the temple the third temple is going to descend from heaven ready-made and it's just going to appear miraculously and, and um, settle, settle down on its proper place. Neither of those, ta of those concepts did we see together in the first uh, book of Maimonides' works on the temple in Hilchot Beit HaBechira. We didn't see that anywhere in those eight chapters. We didn't see anything about Mashiach building the temple, and we didn't see anything about the temple miraculously appearing. Rather, we studied together that the Rambam says, Mitzvata se la sot bayat lashem. These are his first words, as we just read. It is a positive commandment to make a house for God, because the verse says, Va'asuli mikdash. So, now that we have finished our 
our study of Hilchot Beit HaBechira, and before we begin going on to other more specific um, treatments of various important temple topics, let's pause momentarily and see how well we understand what the Rambam has written, and is this indeed what we are walking away with, that is it a positive commandment right now to build the Holy Temple? If the circumstances would present themselves, that right now the government of Israel was willing and the geopolitical reality somehow was um, um, conducive to this and there were no political obstacles and all the various forces that are part of the equation were somehow uh, aligned and ready for this. From a halachic standpoint, from a religious standpoint, could we go ahead and build the temple? I would hope that you think so, after everything that we've been through together. But believe it or not, some people, they don't have that clear. And they're saying, well, you know, and forget about the political obstacles for a moment, because that's not really what we're dealing with right now. We have answers to those issues and those questions, but that is not within the scope of our of our topic right now because I'm more concerned about those who say and they actually believe, there are those who believe that the Torah itself does not want us to build a temple. And as far as I'm concerned, they're standing the whole Torah on its head and they're saying, no, that's not what Hashem wants. You're not reading it right. They're saying, no, you don't have any right to build a temple. That's not even what Hashem wants. When the time comes, one day, Either the messianic figure is going to be revealed and he's going to take care of it, or it's going to be miraculously revealed, it's going to descend from heaven. But this notion that we are trying to emphasize to you, the notion taught by the Temple Institute, and the notion I think which you got a very clear feeling of from the Rambam himself, that idea is no. It's a positive commandment to build a temple. If it's a positive commandment for us to wear tzitzits, we have to make them. We have to tie the strings. If it's a positive commandment for us to sit in a sukkah, we have to build a sukkah. Nobody amongst the Orthodox Jewish public waits around for the sukkah to come down from heaven. Rather, we have to build it. Somebody once said, we have to build it, if you remember that. And then we're able to fulfill the commandment of sitting in the sukkah. So why should it be that when it comes to this particular mitzvah, which is indeed a difficult thing to understand how is it going to come about in view of the present geopolitical reality and all of the political problems and all of the different things and the stalemate and they say and they say and America doesn't get permission and all sorts of different things. Let's say that that wasn't the issue right now. What are we supposed to do as Jews? What does the Torah want us to do? That's what I want to discuss for a moment. We can discuss the other issues as well. But at least admit that the Torah wants us to build the temple that that is our duty as Jews, that every prophet of Israel calls us to rebuild the temple and that nothing ever happened to change Exodus 25.8. No cancellation order, like I like to say, was ever received. So where do these things come from, these other ideas? Where do they fit in, these ideas, within the body of Israel and within the consciousness and maybe with a subconscious framework mentality of the Jewish people? Where do we get these ideas? It's going to come from heaven. Does such an, an idea exist in the Torah? I'd like to analyze that. Or even the idea of, well, Mashiach is going to come and he's going to take care of everything, all your problems. He's Mr. Plumber. All your problems are going to go down the drain and he's going to see to it that, that he takes care of the temple and you're off the hook completely. Is that true? Are we off the hook? Did you see any of the mitzvot in the Torah that say, this mitzvah is only for the Mashiach to do, like some sort of fire alarm, break, you know, the Mashiach has to break it and do it. Is there a mitzvah that's wrapped up in cellophane that says this isn't for you to do, this is waiting for him to do? So if there's a commandment in Exodus 25, 8, you shall build from your sanctuary, all the other commandments are for all of Israel. So where does that come from? But wait, we're going to discuss all of this and look at each point and try to analyze if the notion of the temple coming down from heaven indeed appears in the Torah. And we're going to analyze if the notion of Mashiach coming, the Messiah has to come and personally build the temple, does that appear in the Torah? And what are the historical precedents regarding the first temple and regarding the second temple? Is that what happened? Did they come down from heaven? 
Did a Messiah build them? And if not, who says there should be a difference between the third temple and the first and second temple? If the first and second temple were built by normal human agency, people building with bricks and mortar and stone, as we are instructed to do so in the Rambam, why would that be any different for the third temple? Maybe it's written somewhere that when it comes to the third temple, there's a different type of circumstances. It's something that is supernatural. Does it say that? Because if it doesn't say that, then you have no right to say that the third temple is going to be built in a different manner than the first and second temple. So I'd like to take some time now that we're a little bit more expert with the concept of the mitzvot regarding the temple, everything that we've learned in Hilchot Bet Debechira, and see what is the practical application of all of this. Here we are in the month of Cheshvan. Hashem promised the month of Mar Cheshvan that it's going to be payback time. And one time he's going to correct the incident that embarrassed Cheshvan, that even though the first temple was finished then, it wasn't de dedicated until Tishrei, he said, you know what, in the future, we're going to change everything and Mar Cheshvan is going to host the most beautiful holiday of all, the dedication of the Third Temple. The, the irony of all of this beautiful Midrash and the, the, the poetic power of our, what our sages are saying is so great uh, that we don't even appreciate it. They're saying, how do you think that's going to happen? How do you think Hashem is going to fix that embarrassment if we don't take it seriously? But yet there is this mentality of waiting, that everything is going to happen on its own. And of course, as soon as you subscribe to that, you are off the hook, no pressure. Hashem will do it. Hashem is going to do everything. And I would like to put forth to you the idea that that kind of thinking, to say Hashem is going to take care of it, is not really Jewish. But rather, that maybe is foreign influence that has crept into the mentality of the Jewish people as a result of, of the long and bitter diaspora experience. But that's not really Jewish thinking. The Jewish mindset, based on the Torah, is Hashem commands us to do something and we do it. There's no other commandment in the whole Torah that you can find a parallel to of Hashem fulfilling. Why pick the third temple? Where did that come from? It didn't happen when it came to the first temple. It didn't happen when it came to the second temple. And we're going to talk about the circumstances historically, what it was like in the time of the first temple, what it was like in the time of the second temple. But yet, it was done. So where did this come from, this idea that when it comes to the Third Temple, everything is going to be different, it's going to be mystical, it's going to be supernatural, and it's going to come down, or Mashiach is going to build it, and, and that very notion, equating those two things, is also very problematic. People seem to think that the Messiah that we are awaiting, that the Torah tells us about, is some supernatural figure that only He can take care of the temple, only He is going to build it. If it really says that in the Torah, let's see, that's one thing. But if it doesn't say that, we're in trouble here, because maybe it means that our whole conception of who Mashiach is, is a little bit askew, it's a little bit off. Maybe we're thinking about Mashiach the way some other people might think about Him, but that's not the way the Torah is describing Mashiach, because He's not superhuman. He's a great man, He's the greatest man, He's the most righteous man, He has the ability as a teacher to totally bring everyone together and to totally inaugurate the, the sovereignty of Hashem, as it were, in the world. But He's not God. So let's understand all of this. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to look at the Rambam himself. Because here, in Hilchot Beit HaBechira, the very first thing that he says is, it's a positive commandment to build the temple. But all the naysayers that I'm referring to, those people who think that maybe it has to come down from heaven or that maybe Mashiach has to, has to build it, the very first thing that they do is, if they know a little bit of something, that is, the, the very first thing that they do is they come and they say, but doesn't the Rambam himself, somewhere else in his great works, doesn't he himself say something about Mashiach building it? And they cite from a different work of the Rambam's Mishneh Torah, a different book, the book that we learned together, is called Hilchot Beit HaBechira, The Laws of the Chosen House, and it's in the section called Sefer Avodah, which is the book of service. That means the service of the temple, and it talks, that entire volume talks about all sorts of different aspects of the temple service. However, there is another book of the Rambam's Mishneh Torah. It's called Shoftim, The Laws of Judges. And at the very end of that work, 
the Rambam has some interesting entries regarding the Messianic era. And some people cite from that section, and they claim that there, the Rambam seems to be indicating differently than he wrote in Hilchot Beit Bechira. He doesn't seem to be saying that we're going to build the temple. He seems to be saying that Mashiach is going to build the temple. So we need to look at all of these sources. And of course, first and foremost, we need to look at the verses in the Torah itself to see and to discern what exactly are the circumstances, what exactly is the nature of the building of the temple. And we need to get to the bottom of this because we do need to take it seriously, just as we find the Rambam took it so seriously and, and encoded and decoded everything and really brought the temple, as it were, down from heaven and showed us that it really is a very serious, very practical, very fundamental law in the Torah. So we're going to explore this here in the month of Cheshvan to see whether we can be the generation to correct the embarrassment of this month and to bring the Shekhinah back to the world, to rebuild the temple, the light to Israel and the light to the nations.